on uh, how you spell Presbyterian. It's all about uh, uh, kind of the uniqueness of the Presbyterianism and uh, what that means for us and what the benefits are uh, for us. And we're going to be reading um, this morning uh, first from the John chapter 20, verses 19 through 22. This is actually John's version of the Pentecost story. It never gets included in the lecture, but I think it's a wonderful passage about the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's kind of John's theological take about what happened in Acts chapter 2. So I'm going to, and we have two brief gospel readings. I'm going to invite you to stand for them as you are able. And let's listen to God's word for us. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, the doors of the house where the disciples met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he said this to them, he breathed on them. And he said to them, Receive Holy Spirit. Here is our first gospel reading, and now from the gospel of Mark, chapter 2, earlier, much earlier on in Jesus' ministry. Uh, Jesus is yet again uh, in conflict with the Pharisees about, uh, about how we go about doing things in the life of the faith community. Jesus went out again beside the sea. The whole crowd gathered around him, and he taught them. As he was walking along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up. And he followed him. And as he sat at dinner in Levi's home, many tax collectors and sinners were also sitting with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and with tax collectors, they said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard this, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I have come not to call righteous, but sinners. Now, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to him, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples don't fast? And so Jesus said to them, Well, the wedding guests cannot fast while the bridegroom is with them, can they? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast on that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak or jacket. Otherwise, the patch pulls away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is, the law, is lost, and so are the skins. One puts new wine to fresh wineskins. The word of the Lord. Thank you, God. And you may be seated. Well, I am probably going to live to regret it, but I'm going to start this sermon with a series of light bulb jokes. It's more than we can in small crowd. I think I'd be away with it, okay? How many charismatics, for instance, does it take to change a light bulb? The answer is only one. I mean, after all, our hands are already in the air. <laughs> How many Episcopalians does it take to change a light bulb? The answer is two. One to call the electrician and one to mix the martinis. My apologies <laughs> to any Episcopalians in the congregation. How many Roman Catholics does it take to change a light bulb? None. We don't use light bulbs here, only candles. Mormons. How many Mormons? Five. One man to change the light bulb and four women wives to tell him how to do it. How many 
Unitarians does it take to change the light bulb? We choose not to make a statement either in favor of or against light bulbs. However, if in your own journey you have found that light bulbs are work for you, that's fantastic. You're invited to compose a poem or a modern dance about your relationship with light bulbs and present it at our annual light bulb service, which will explore a number of light bulb traditions, including but not limited to incandescent fluorescent LED tinted, now, all of which are equally valid paths to luminescence. That's the Unitarians. Lutherans. The Lutherans is a change change. You can't do light bulb jokes without getting the Lutherans here in Iowa, I've learned. How many Lutherans? Change? My grandmother gave that light bulb to this church 17 years ago, and we're not changing it. How many Amish does it take? What's a light bulb? Okay. TV evangelists. It only takes one, but for the message of hope to continue, send in your donation today. And last, but certainly not least, how many Presbyterians does it take to change a light bulb? The answer is eight. One to call the electrician, and seven to say how much better they like the old light bulb. <laughs> change. We are going to talk about change this morning. Times they are changing, we all know that that is true, and yet nobody likes to change much, and that certainly includes those of us in the church. It is no secret that the church is one of the last social institutions to kind of catch up with change. We're generally known to lag behind our culture by 40 to 50 years at least. And yet change, just for the sake of change, is no virtue either. That's called chaos and anarchy, isn't it? And so Presbyterians have a saying, in fact it's a historic church principle that deals with change, that helps guide us through turbulent waters. Here it is in Latin. Ecclesia reformatum semper reformanda. You got that? Maybe you want me to translate that a little bit. It goes like this. The church reformed and always being reformed according to the call of the Spirit and the Word of God. The church reformed and always being reformed according to the call of the Spirit and the Word of God. That's one of our foundational principles as Presbyterians. In fact, Presbyterian theology is often called Reformed theology for this very reason. Presbyterians are, or at least we seek to be, reformed and always being reformed according to the call of the Spirit of the Word of God. Now let's break that down. It begins, of course, by challenging the assumption that older, just by virtue of being older, is necessarily better, and that preservation, just for preservation's sake, has great value. <clears throat> The gospel, Jesus says in Mark chapter 2, our gospel, our first of our gospel, or second of our gospel readings, the gospel, Jesus says, is new wine. It's like new wine. And new wine, he says, needs new wineskins. In other words, it needs new structures, new ways of ministry to keep it alive and vibrant, to preserve it. If we always do what we have always done, we will always get what we've always got. If nothing changes, nothing changes. That saying actually comes from Alcoholics Anonymous. And yet it seems just as applicable to the church today. Change. So in Mark chapter 2, Jesus says that he is not going to be governed by these old purity regulations which excluded somebody like Matthew who was an unclean, unpatriotic Jew from the presence of the faith community. And Jesus says he is not going to abide by that. That's why the Pharisees were so upset with him because he was breaking a tradition of the church. Jesus says excluding somebody like Levi is like trying to sow a piece of unshrunken cloth onto an old coat. 
As soon as it's washed, the patch pulls away, and a worse tear is made, in fact, worse than the one you were trying to cover up to begin with. Or again, says Jesus, the gospel is like new wine. The good news is bursting at the seams. It is fermenting, he is saying here. And it cannot be contained by any single human structure or theology. And so the church is always in need of reform according to the call of the Spirit because the Holy Spirit is always alive, is always on the move, is always fermenting within the hearts and the minds of human beings and within the common life of the church together. Just as the Holy Spirit transformed those first disciples from a fearful group of losers locked in that upper room as we find them in John's Gospel, chapter 20, into a literally world-changing movement at Pentecost. So the Spirit is still empowering disciples to leave their fear and their anxiety and to enter the world in mission and in ministry. And so for the sake of the advancement of the gospel, the church always needs to be open to reform. To everything about the church is open to the possibility of reform. Our worship, the way we organize and structure ourselves, the way we do mission and ministry, the way we even express our faith in the world. <coughs> Presbyterians believe that we are never done. We don't think that we've ever arrived, quote unquote, reached a state where we have attained perfection and therefore we no longer need to be changing anymore. And that's why the book of order, the, the book that guides our life as Presbyterians, is changing all the time. In fact, every two years, a new edition of the book of order comes out with changes that we have made. If 51% of our presbyteries, those regional governing bodies, approve of a change, then that's it. It happens. And the same is basically true for the Book of Confessions, although it takes more of a majority. It takes two-thirds of the presbyteries to change the Book of Confessions. And so this year, for instance, we're going to be adding, in the new edition of the Book of Order, or the Book of Confessions, a new confession, the Confession of Belhar which is a confession that comes out of South um, of Africa. And so we all need to be aware of the seven last words of the church. You've heard the seven last words of the church, haven't you? They are this. We've never done it that way before. Watch out. Because those seven last words may well indeed be the last words of the church. And the church isn't alone in this need to change. In the 1940s, for instance, the Swiss watch, the Swiss watch was widely considered to be the most prestigious and the most uh, advanced, the most highly crafted watch in the whole world. As a result, 80% of the watches in the world in the 1940s were made in Switzerland. In the late 1950s, there was a man who had an idea for a different kind of a watch. It was called a digital watch. A digital watch with those little red LEDs on it. And he came and he talked to the, the, the uh, conglomeration of the companies in Switzerland and presented his idea and tried to sell it to them. But they didn't want to have anything to do with this little red LED thing because after all, they made the best watch in the whole world and they had the best watchmakers in the whole world. Why would anybody want to get a stupid thing like a little red LED watch? As a result, that man went on in his search to find a buyer, somebody would manufacture this little LED watch. And he went to a very small, um, obscure Japanese company by the name of Seiko. Well, so they liked that idea. And so they went with it. In 1940, the switch watchmaking companies employed 80,000 people. Today, they employ 18 
thousand people because they didn't get with the, the swing of things. When within 30 years, 80% of the watches in the world were digital. And by the way, today, just for your information, I was surprised that two-thirds of those between the ages of 16 and 32 don't own a watch at all. What do they use? Oh. Your cell phone. Your cell phone. Tell time. They don't even own a watch. Talk about changing times, right? Change, friends, is inevitable. Especially in our time. I remember going to a conference once, and one of the speakers there said that this current generation of that you know, 16 to 30 year old, this current generation will go through more change in their lifetime than all generations in human history combined. Now, I don't know how exactly you measure something like that, but I imagine that probably is very true. It's mind boggling. And if churches like St. Paul want to reach this generation, then we're going to have to be reformed and reforming according to the call of the Spirit. Pentecost demands that we do that because we cannot contain the Holy Spirit, which is ever reaching out to new people in new ways. And yet, change simply for change's sake is no great virtue either. It is as dangerous as preservation just for preservation's sake. And so our misused motto, Ecclesia Reformanda, Ecclesia Semper Reformata, challenges the liberal assumption that all change is good as much as it does the conservative assumption that all change is bad. The paradoxical thing about what Jesus is saying in Mark chapter 2 is that the very reason that we sew patches onto old jackets is because old jackets are oftentimes well worth preserving, right? They are worth preserving. Now, I've got some old t-shirts that I think Rebecca would take issue with on that. She'd probably like me to toss them out, but nonetheless, the general principle holds true. Oftentimes, old things are well worth preserving. And the very reason that we put new wine into old wine skins is that wine itself is worth preserving. It's the same general principle in our story. And so when the Protestant reformers were breaking away from the Catholic Church and forming the Protestant Church, they never saw themselves as creating a new church. They simply saw themselves as reforming, as recovering something which had been lost because of laxity in the passage of time. So our model goes, church reformed and always being reformed according to the call of the Spirit, yes, but what else? Also according to the Word of God. The church isn't to be reformed simply because we think that we need to quote unquote get relevant Get with the times. Come on, church, get with the times. That's not it at all. Rather, we need to reform in order to be more faithful to the Word of God, to the Bible, to recover that which is vital in our heritage. Part of the reason that we Presbyterians, by the way, emphasize the Word of God here is because we have kind of a deep distrust of human nature. In fact, we have this doctrine about human nature is called total depravity. Have you ever heard of total depravity? It's, it's one of the five points of TULIP, uh, which is kind of this high, uh, old thing that defined uh, Protestant or the Reformed theology now. Now, total depravity doesn't mean that everything that humans do is totally depraved. Although, well, you might think so after meeting some people. Yes. <laughs> Poor Dennis. <laughs> Actually, though, what it does mean is that there is no part of our human life that isn't somehow tainted by sin. There's no part, not everything is all bad, but there's no part that is untouched by sin. No human endeavor, including even those things that we do in our own hearts for God, no human endeavor is free of distortion. As Proverbs says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in, in the end, it is the way to death. We can't really trust human nature very much. 
And so we need an external check, a plumb line against which we must test our distorted thinking, and that plumb line is Holy Scripture. Otherwise, it's just your opinion versus my opinion on one fad of the ages against the next fad of the next age. So then, where does that leave us? Where does that leave us? Well, in a sense, it leave, leaves us between a rock and a hard place, if you think about it, right? Because on the one hand, we've got the Pentecostal power of the Holy Spirit that is always fermenting, always uh, 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 expanding, always tumultuous, and always demanding change. But then on the other hand, we've got the Word of God, which is always saying to us, don't forget, you know, those foundational truths that we have. And in between those, we're called to find the truth. And when we have the Word of God, it's always pushing us to test those truths against the Holy Scripture. And that's not always an easy place to be. And yet Presbyterians believe that that is the place that we're supposed to be. That God wants us to live in that creative tension between the Spirit of God and the Word of God. And that it is in that place, in that, that pressure cooker between those two forces that we actually are molded and shaped to become more like Jesus Christ. It is in that place where our minds, we can be transformed in the renewal of our minds, as Romans 12 says. So it's neither word nor spirit, but rather word and spirit. So our misuse model really isn't either a conservative thing, nor a liberal or progressive thing. Rather, it's something far more radical than either of those camps could have possibly imagined. In fact, Radical, from the Latin root, we're really doing with Latin today, aren't we, huh? Radical comes from the Latin root radix, which in fact means root. That might be the best way to describe it. It is a radical statement that roots us in the Word of God and the Spirit of God, and it enables us to change in the right way, in the right time, for the right reason. The right way. Right time, right reason. So, 25 cent question for us individually and collectively is, are we willing to change in the right way at the right time for the right reason? That's a great question for us to ponder a little bit. You know, I'll be honest with you, sometimes in my own life, on some of these difficult issues that we seem to keep coming to in the church and the life of faith. Issues like worship style, issues like homosexuality, issues like abortion, political issues and things like that. On these really tough issues, every once in a while I really have to sit back and ask myself if I am really and truly seeking the truth or if quite honestly I am simply protecting territory that I have staked out earlier in my life. This is my belief. Oh, I've got a lot invested in this belief. I've said this belief all along. I better stick to this belief, right? I don't want to look foolish for changing my beliefs. And the older I get, and I am getting older, the more and more tempting that option is, isn't it? To just cling to things because that's what I've been saying all along and I don't want to look foolish. Lord, have mercy. The Lord opened us all up to be radical according to the call of the Spirit and the Word of God. Let's pray. Gracious God, that indeed this day we can sense the Holy Spirit hovering over the waters, the Holy Spirit hovering over our hearts, and calling us not for change for change's sake, but rather change in order to recover something vital that perhaps we have lost over time, to recover something foundational in the Word of God. Guide us and lead us, Lord, as St. Paul ponders some deep changes. Help us, Lord, to be open to your leading and to listen and to talk to one another and above all, to listen to the Word of God and the call of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Lord, pray this in Jesus' name.